So if we think of the way the world looks today, we might imagine that a map of the world looks a little something like this. And if you were to imagine that the world looks something like this, you would be right, and you would also be wrong. For years and centuries, we have relied on central trusted third parties to distribute ownership of our identity, our rights, and our land. And that's largely because we had no effective mechanism to organize the underpinnings of our interconnected web of humanity. Now, all of these nations are fundamentally centralized infrastructure and what is centralized infrastructure? It's an organization that we've needed to communicate system to system instead of human to human. Organizations who are generally and largely based on principles of scarcity and violence to propagate the consolidation of resources to survive or to help its humans survive. And what does this fundamentally create? Some might say that it creates organization, information being stored in the minds of tribal chiefs or kings and queens who fundamentally owned everything, and then now the nation state, the corporation, and the central bank. But these ideas of ownership are outdated, and they are propagating injustice, robbing rights from the hands of the individual, who should, in fact, not be the bottom of the pyramid, but the center of the way every system rotates around the gravity of meaning. Now, what's interesting about nation states is that they've actually already been replaced. When you think about the number of interactions you have per day and the number of interactions you might have with a nation state, we lived in an inherently networked society. And the functions that were previously provided by the nation, i.e. jurisdiction, are no longer necessary. We no longer need middlemen to structure and govern the cosmology of our interactions. This is actually more how we communicate. It's not one to one. We really are a cosmology of being. And that is exactly why we are creating culture. Culture is replacing government as we know it. So when you think about traditional government, you might have some interesting images come to mind, especially recently. It's fascinating to me because I've been working on the virtual nation movement for about three and a half, four years. And it wasn't until Brexit and it wasn't until Trump that people actually started realizing the gravity of the implications of what we've been working on. So traditional governments are based on the concentration and the control of resources, which fundamentally propagates the idea that we should use violence to take from one another, that we should be selfish. It encourages closed networks with low trust. And this list of behaviors from secrecy, secrecy to lying to violence, all of these are propagated by the idea that there's never been enough to go around. There's never been enough for everyone. And if we really want to survive as a species, we need to rely on institutions that can be violent for us in the pursuit of prosperity, a prosperity that we as individuals would have never otherwise been able to have. That world no longer exists in practice. And we already have the infrastructure with things, you know, like the internet. We already have the infrastructure underneath our entire world that has replaced government. There's inherent corruption. You know, there, the amount of money, the trillions of dollars that are stolen per year from government, if we actually replace that and repurposed it to the entire human race, we could cure global hunger, we could solve the water crisis, we could end the violence and the destruction today. We do not have to continue paying for corruption. I'm going to repeat that. We do not have to continue paying for corruption, period. Now, in addition to the organizational engine of traditional government being outdated, it is also extremely inefficient, and the capital expenditure layered on top of that is wasting our hard-earned innocent money on a daily basis to propagate systems that aren't actually working for us, but in many instances are working against us to promote opagalistic structures to take strongholds over our fundamental access to our basic human and economic rights and liberties. So what is culture? 
Culture takes a nation state and transforms it from a centralized organization into what we already have, the way we actually are and work, which is fundamentally open networks of governance that are radically inclusive, radically self-reliant. Our work has been compared to something along the lines of quantified Burning Man, and yes, that is exactly how I imagine the future should look. We use peer-to-peer -peer engagement of humans and their resources, which means that you should never have a society in which one person believes there is something morally wrong with contributing to a system, whether that is medical marijuana, whether that's universal health care, and another person believes that it is fundamentally right for everyone to have legal access to whatever kind of substance they should choose. Those two people should never in a million years be forced to pay into the same system because they share different values. And if we all stood up and respected each other and the way we believe this world should work just a little bit, maybe we could actually have some peace in this world. I believe that is possible, but it is going to take every single one of us, every single person in this room, every single person in this city, and every single person on this planet to make that happen. We also have embedded financial infrastructure, which means we have sovereign tokens that can actually compensate people economically for uplifting principles of civic responsibility. You can reward someone for picking up a piece of trash in the same way that a garbage can should send someone tokens for doing the exact same act. And when we actually encourage people to be economically rewarded for being good citizens and for being good to each other, we change the inherent value structure of the way we thought about organizing our cultures, our societies, the way we live and work today. And in addition to that, we fundamentally manage ecosystems to coordinate toward problem solving, not toward accumulating resources, but toward actually solving problems and in solving those problems, creating more economic value for your community in a free market of other communities that are also working together to solve each other's problems and the biggest problem this world faces today. So that is our solution. And what do we provide? Well, we have systems of self-sovereign identity that are inherently verified by webs of trust. That means social verification and not necessarily using the centralized consolidation of biometrics to, again, place another and further layer of ownership over a group of people who may not have access or ownership to their own bodies anymore. So that means that you can have a public identity that's verified by a nation state and you can also have a completely anonymous identity, Better World Hacker 23, that is verified through a network of people, one of whom might know who you are and the person who you're actually doing the work for might be, you might be totally anonymous to them with the exception that you've had a trusted third party that is your friend come in to verify that you exist and you're living in Saudi Arabia where as a woman you're not allowed to have a job but you want the right to work. So that's fun fundamentally how we think about identity. It's social verification, human verification, and that is the cosmology of our interaction. We also provide deeds and marriage rights. So if you're LGBTQ and living in a place like Uganda, you have the ability to get married on the blockchain outside of the confines of your nation state with a group of people saying, I know that this person is this person and I know that this person is this person and they may choose to remain anonymous to the system, but if they want to move to Canada and show the Canadian government that they have in fact been married for the last 20 years and maybe they'd like some benefits or access to their own rights, they actually have the capability to do that and they have the capability to show systems who might verify them that their love is real. We have land titles and fundamentally we also encourage any person in the world to eliminate the economic friction that we would need to create a company, fundamentally reducing the individual's obligation to rely on a centralized system to participate in a marketplace and to engage in their own network of free trade agreements. That is economic liberation and it doesn't cost much for anyone in the world to be able to do that or gain access to that. And that may be a group as an individual or a sovereign indigenous nation. And the flow of the network of this capital, the way this is going to increase commerce, the way this will change the way we interact, actually can propagate the redistribution of abundance of our resources that have been held and owned outside of our hands for too long. What this means at the end of the day is not only are we creating marketplaces for governments, marketplaces for you to create your own nations, we're creating marketplaces for all forms of community to build their own governance services. So what might some of these look like? Well, 
imagine that your body is a database, just like the Bitcoin blockchain is a database. And imagine that you have something that can gather information about what's going on inside of your body on a nano level, not just a low intensity data gatherer like a Fitbit that's used to change your behaviors, but something that can actually get biometric information from you, whether that's blood work or beyond. And you're contributing that information to a database of everyone's body in the world and all of your bodies are working together and there are either people that are doctors or artificial intelligences that are working together collectively to solve human health problems. And every time one of those health problems is solved, the same way Bitcoin is generated when an ASIC miner solves a very complex math problem and it receives the computer that solves the problem, receives the capital and all the other computers verify that. Anytime we solve a global health problem using a database of every person's body on earth that can be anonymous or public, you have an AI solve a problem and then every person who's contributed information towards solving to that problem could get paid and could get access to health. These are some of the ideas that we're thinking about in terms of the future of our service applications for a human race. In addition to that, we have universal basic education that redistributes and changes the process of learning toward the incentivized gamification of real world problem solving. So no longer are we basing our knowledge on memorizing facts but on our ability to actually think critically and analytically and solve problems in real time for an economic prize. Universal income, I think, is just a subset of everything that's happening in the blockchain movement. I don't think there will be one person who will provide any of these things. In fact, if there was one person who provided any of these things, I think it would be fundamentally wrong. We need marketplaces for services like this, and those are just a couple of ideas on how they might work, but I might be completely wrong. I'm under no impression that the ability to build this system is in my hands. It's not, it's in ours. So I'd love to hear if anyone else has any other ideas or is interested in building any of these systems on culture. Culture is a decentralized governance layer, effectively, that enables anyone in the world to build a decentralized government. And that starts with registration and jurisdiction and it evolves into services and more complex marketplace dynamics. Just like Ethereum is a decentralized application that allows people to build decentralized applications, culture is a decentralized governance layer that allows anyone in the world to build a decentralized government, a marketplace of marketplaces. And this is, is building it so far. <laughs> there are a lot of us. Uh, but just to get started, I'll, I'll name a few key components of this, which is, um, my name is Tony Lane. Hello, everyone. Tony Lane Casterly, TLC. Um, one of my other business partners is Chief Phil Lane, Jr. He's one of the most prominent indigenous leaders in the entire world. He is a member, of the, a member and a leader of the Dakota and the Chickasaw tribe. He is a spiritual elder. He's also on the High Council of the Maori. And he is one of the unifying structures between every indigenous community and network in the entire world. And this has been his life purpose since he's been born. Um, has actually contributed significantly and is a, a leader at Standing Rock among, among many of the other pipeline projects that um, they have helped to stop. The other person who I'll mention is our technology collaborator, Christopher Allen, who is the chief architect of Blockstream and the co-creator of SSL. Uh, he is also a leader of the Web of Trust community and he is helping us scale out our solutions for self-sovereign identity systems. Most of our board consists of activists like Kasha Jacqueline, who is actually the reason why they, she's an LGBTQ activist from Uganda, who's actually the reason why the Kill All the Gays bill was released to the press and stopped. She snuck a pen into parliament that was actually a microphone <laughs> and sent the information from the Ugandan parliament about their plans to execute people for being LGBTQ to every person she knew in the media. She is powerful and incredible and one of the largest LGBTQ representatives for the entire African continent. And this could be you too. So if you want to be a part of this, um, you know, we are bringing more people onto the team and I'm always open. This is a fully open source project. So would love to have people come up and would love to have anyone who wants to invest or anyone who wants to get involved. Um, feel free to approach me after this or feel free to send me an email. You'll see my email at the end of this presentation. Um, so the way, just to quickly walk through this, um, in terms of the way our decentralized application layer works in the same way that Ethereum is a, scoot, 
Casey, there you go. In the same way that Ethereum is a decentralized application layer that enables people to build decentralized applications, we work in a similar way, except that we fundamentally have a model that's based on principles of economic scarcity. So finite token limit, and anyone can build a decentralized application on top, which will feed into the overarching value of the initial token class, similar to the way that Ethereum works, except um, not actually subject to the ability for someone to perversely control or inflate the economy, but giving everyone the ability to create their own economies, leveraging actually one of my favorite principles of Bitcoin. I call this like the kind of like the Chiara Skiro or the Occam's razor of the Bitcoin network in that Bitcoin's inherently scarce. There are only 21 million Bitcoins that will ever exist on the whole planet ever. And yet it enables anyone in the world to create their own economy. And I think that's so powerful. And I think the level of ingenuity that it takes to create something that is so diverse, dynamic and complex is obviously the invention that's going to save our humanity. So thanks, Satoshi. <laughs> um, and essentially culture is an API allowing anyone to plug in, build on whatever they want to build, a meta layer architecture. Um, and the token mechanics are very similar to something like Ethereum, except the economic underpinnings of our structure work like Bitcoin. So we are raising money right now. Yay, there's money stuff. If you want to talk to me about it, come up and talk to me later. So be your own state. If you want to get in contact with me, my email is really simple. It's tlc at c-u-l-t-u dot r-e. That's culture, just dot r-e. And the dot r-e is meant to represent the idea that our culture is not only a replication, but it is a response to everything that happens around us. So thank you guys for sitting here with me and being present with me and I look forward to answering questions and seeing how you guys respond to some of these ideas.